Good evening, Cornerstone. Pastor Phil here. Welcome to Cornerstone. You, uh, we are looking at the book of Hebrews for the past 40 years, it feels like, uh, but not really. And tonight we are beginning chapter 10, which is actually the, uh, the closing passage of the author's argument that says, that will uh, quote Miss Terry from last week, the new covenant is superior to the old covenant. Jesus' sacrifice is superior to the high priest's sacrifice. And uh, the theme of Jesus is superior, or Jesus is better, or Jesus is greater, has been the theme of the book uh, from chapter 1 on. And uh, remember, our context here is that these were, this book is being written to, um, to uh, Christians who had been Jews, who are um, facing persecution now for their Christian faith, and they are more or less contemplating returning back to Judaism uh, to a place of relative safety in the ancient Roman world. And the author here is arguing that what you had before is, is patently inferior to what you have now. Why would you go back? And so I'm going to uh, tonight start in chapter 8, which is where I taught. I think it's actually where I where we taught uh, one of the last weeks we were in session back in the actual building. So let's go back to chapter 8 real quick, and we'll pick up in verse 7 and 8. Hebrews 8, 7 and 8 says, For if there had been nothing wrong with the first covenant, no place would have been sought for another. But God found fault with the people and said... Now, this was where the author is going to uh, offer a lengthy quote from Jeremiah chapter 31. And I have some, um, I've curtailed the author's quote uh, on this next slide, uh, beginning in uh, Hebrews, Hebrews 8, verse 10. This is the covenant I will establish with the people of Israel. After that time, declares the Lord, I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, Know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, for I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. This is the new covenant being prophesied here in Jeremiah, the covenant that Christ has come to usher in. And this is, the, the again, this covenant is the covenant that is um, so much better than what the Jews had already known under the old covenant of laws and sacrifices. Now we have a new covenant of relationship through Jesus. So let's begin chapter 10, uh, looking at verse 1. The law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never be, it can never, by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. Otherwise, would they not have stopped being offered? For the worshipers would have been cleansed once for all and would no longer have felt guilty for their sins. But those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins. It is impossible for the, bl the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. As we said before, the old covenant was established by God and has always intended to be temporary. It could not finally forever remove sins. All it could do is to appease God in the present for sins committed, and with, with the expectation that one day in the future, a sacrifice will be made to cover all sins from the past. See, the people who lived in the Old Covenant did so, perhaps maybe without even understanding it, they did so in the hopes that the New Covenant would come and would provide actual forgiveness for their sins, actual redemption, and actual salvation uh, from their own, their own doomed destiny. In that verse, uh, verse two, where it said that um, you know, questioning why the sacrifices continued, if, if they worked, uh, would they not have stopped being offered? For the worshippers would have been cleansed once for all, and would no longer have felt guilty for their sins. The fact that the sacrifices continued, the author argues, is proof that they were not efficacious enough. They were they did not produce a lasting, permanent effect of of, of sinlessness. That people uh, continued to sin, continued to be the same person, but the sacrifice was done uh, as an act of. Um, of repentance and perhaps to, to express to God a desire to be um, made righteous, but the sacrifice itself did not have the power to achieve that. Um, we'll get into more of that in a second, but I want to communicate here the idea the author is expressing that the sacrifices, it's not that they don't work now, they've never worked. They've never worked. 
the sacrifices did not produce sinlessness. We mentioned it in a previous week, well, and I'll, I'll say it again here. The Old Covenant was a, a way of, of maintaining uh, an external righteousness, okay? And it's the New Covenant that makes it internal. That's why Jesus, in, in, um, in the Gospels, he talks about how, you know, he says, you have heard, uh, do not kill, and I say, don't be angry. If you've been angry with someone, you have basically killed them in your hearts. You, know, you have heard it say, don't commit adultery, but I say, don't even lust. Because if you lust, you commit adultery in your hearts. And so the Old Covenant um, focused primarily, not entirely, because there's the law, you know, thou shalt not covet, but was more or less a covenant where, wherein people could uh, look to have or try to have external forms of righteousness, and the sacrifices were a way of dealing with the committed acts of sinfulness, but the actual person on the inside, the internal person, did not change and was not transformed by those sacrifices. Okay, So the author's point here is that, uh, back in verse 4, it says, It is possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. If the, the, a, a bull or a goat, their, their death has, does not have enough sacrificial power to wipe away the sins uh, of, of, of anyone. Hebrews 10.5 says, uh, Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body prepared for me with burnt offerings and sin offerings you were not pleased. Then I said, Here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, my God. This is from Psalm 40. And in the midst of, you know, the, the author has been unpacking Jeremiah 31 for, you know, since chapter 8, 9, and 10. And now, at the very end, he's going to squeeze in Psalm 40 as well for extra nuance. But the, the idea here is that the Old Covenant was created temporarily. It, 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 it did not... It did not satisfy God. It appeased him temporarily, but he doesn't want sacrifices. He doesn't want those offerings. He, he's not pleased by you know by burning offerings. To burn animals smells so gross, so gross. Okay, it's not a, the Bible calls it a pleasing aroma to, to, to God, and, and it is in the sense that it expresses our desire to be in relationship with him. And elsewhere in scripture, it says that the, the, the prayers of the saints are a pleasing aroma to God. And in, in that sense, you know, the sacrifices did please God because they expressed our heart's desire to be near him. But at, after a certain point, God himself says the Israelites continue to sacrifice, continue to make offerings, but their hearts were no longer in it. And therefore, those offerings and sacrifices became attestable to God. They no longer pleased him. So it isn't the sacrifice in itself, it's the heart behind it. Okay, and the sacrifice did not have the power to transform the heart. The heart might desire to please God, but the heart cannot achieve it because it doesn't have the power on its own. It's not transformed. It's still a broken, uh, sinful human heart. It needs something more than what a blood, the blood of bulls and goats, can do. And the point of quoting Psalm 40 here is the author is indicating that the old covenant has led us to this point where Jesus has come. He says, here I am, and he is the one come to do God's will and to establish a new covenant. We'll pick it up in, uh, in verse uh, 8. First he said, sacrifices and offerings, burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not desire, nor were you pleased with them, though they were offered in accordance with the law. So the, even even if the sacrifices were done properly, it, the the actual performance of the of the rite and ceremony was done properly. It's not about the performance; it's about the person and their 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 posture before God. Continuing uh, in verse nine, then he said, "Here I am. I have come to do your will." He sets aside the first to establish the second, and by that will we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. The simple implication of this passage is that the old covenant sacrifices, though they were done according to the customs, according to the laws given by God, they did not have power in themselves to remove sin. God accepted them as a temporary appeasement, but he did not want them. He wanted the relationship, and that could only be achieved uh, achieved through the, the self-sacrifice of God himself to the Son, Jesus. Jesus came so that relationship between humanity and the Trinity could be restored. This is the essence of the New Covenant, and that's why it's better than the Old Covenant. The Old Covenant was a band-aid. The New Covenant is a heart transplant. We get the heart of God, and so we've and, and creating you know, in, in us... Intimacy with God we have not known since the Garden of Eden. 
Continuing on into verse 11, Hebrews says this, or, or rather, sorry. You know, the old covenant was a band-aid. The new covenant is a heart transplant. We have the heart of God inside of us, creating an intimacy between God and man that has not been known since the Garden of Eden. This is what was planned for us from the beginning. This is what God has always wanted. He's not wanted some covenant based upon uh, on laws and regulations that is onerous and hard to follow. He has always wanted to be within us and with us, uplifting us and drawing us closer to himself. You know, that last uh, verse there in, in this passage we just read in verse 10, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. We have been made holy. Time and again in the Old Testament, I'm reading a, 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 um, a Bible in the year right now, and I've been reading a lot of the Old Testament, and time and again God tells the people of Israel, consecrate yourselves, make yourselves holy, prepare yourselves for my presence. And while there's there's something in that we should we should keep in mind that we need to make sure we are preserving the holiness of God in ourselves by by abstaining from certain things and by pursuing other things. That the the implication here is that God has shifted the weight from consecrate yourselves, make yourselves holy before you can approach me. And it shifted to now he has made us holy as we draw near to him. It is through relationship with Jesus that we can um, partake in that holiness and have it for ourselves. The, you know, Christianity uh, shifts the, the weight of, of, of um, the weight of salvation off of us. We don't earn it. God gives it to us. God has performed all the tasks required to, to achieve salvation, and we get to accept that for ourselves. Again, that's the implication here. That's part of why the new covenant is so much better. Going on to verse 11. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, and since that time he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. For by one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy." There's so much to unpack here, and I, don't, I, we don't, I, I, I love that this class allows us to dig deep and to, to examine these passages, but I know that watching a video, you know, you're not have your attention like I might have in the room. So I'm going to unpack a few key things here, but we could spend weeks on just these few verses here. But uh, I love how the, the passage goes through. Verse 11, the Old Testament priest does this. It's repetitive. He does it all the time. All these sacrifices happen. All these offerings are made and for nothing. They're, they're done for nothing because they never could take away the sins and God only accepted them temporarily, but God no longer accepts them because the old covenant is now gone. The new covenant stands in its place and so the priest keeps doing these things to no avail. They're meaningless rituals now. And I love verse 12. But when this priest, but when this priest, that is just, it's so powerful because this priest is Jesus. When this, this priest offered for all time one sacrifice, meaning himself, his own body on the cross, he sat down at the right hand of God. The uh, Matthew and Terry past two past three weeks have talked about how, oh, I guess it's been four weeks almost, actually. That's been a month since I've talked to you guys. But Matt and Terry talked about how in the temple, there was no chair, no place for um, a priest to sit down. They were always standing, doing their job, doing their work. And so these priests have been standing and walking and serving, but to no avail. Our priest, our high priest, did his job, and then he sat down. His work is done. On the cross, he said, it is finished. The one sacrifice has been made, and no others need be made. The high priest has, in that one act, achieved for us our salvation. It is finished. And so he takes his seat. Verse 13, and since that time he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool, for by one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. We are made perfect forever, okay? But those who are being made holy, remember perfect before, it said Jesus himself was made perfect through obedience and through suffering. We are made perfect. We're made not not perfect, like meaning free from moral blemish or free from any defect, because the holy, the, very, the next, next line said, implies that we're being made holy. It's progressive. It's still happening. But we're made perfect. That we're made complete. 
That Jesus fills the hole. He fills what we're lacking. He is our supply. Where we don't have, he gives. He provides. And so he makes us complete. And it's through that completion, that, 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 that heart transplant where the Spirit of God is now within us, that's the process by which we're being made holy. That's sanctification. The Holy Spirit comes to live within us at salvation. It begins to make us more like Jesus, make us more like God, make us holy, and in in that sense prepares us for God's presence for eternity. The next passage uh, begins in verse 15. And now we're finally back to Jeremiah 31 to wrap up this whole argument. Verse 15 says this, The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First he says, This is the covenant I will make with them. After this time, or after that time, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their hearts, and I will write their, them on their minds. Then he adds, their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. Verse 18, and where, and where these have been forgiven, sacrifice for sins is no longer necessary. That our sins are forgiven. That God says in this new covenant, I will remember their lawlessness no more. I will forgive all of their sins, all their lawless acts. It's, it is done with. Verse 18, and where these things have been forgiven, sacrifice for sin is no longer necessary. We don't have to commit sacrifices. We don't have to, to kill the bull or kill the goat or bring the flower or bring the dove or bring the oil or bring anything. We have to receive what Jesus has brought to us. Jesus went to the cross to die for our sins, and he has brought back salvation. And the question is not what we will offer, but but will we receive it? Will we accept it? Will we surrender? Because it's not just that Jesus is bringing us salvation. Jesus is bringing us salvation and citizenship in his kingdom. Jesus is the king. He is the son of God, and he has come to proclaim his kingly authority, and in so doing, and, and so accepting that authority for our lives, surrendering ourselves to him, we are saved we, get, we gain salvation through his death. He is our high priest, but also our king. You know, Hebrews is this great book where he examines Jesus' priestly roles, his sacrificial roles. And elsewhere in the Bible, we see how Jesus has a kingly role. That he, is, he is the king of this new kingdom God's establishing. A kingdom that replaces the old kingdom of Israel. And it's a new kingdom that, that we're, wherein Christ will reign forever. And so both these things are happening at the same time. We accept Jesus' kingly authority and we subject ourselves to him. We become his subjects, his people. And in so doing, we accept the salvation he offers to us as our sacrifice and our priest. And both these things are happening simultaneously. And we are becoming citizens of heaven and we are saved from our sins. I want to I want to end this week by pointing out to you guys a reminder that this entire passage is just the end of a, of a three chapter long, eight, nine, and ten argument that the old covenant is not worth returning to. And that, that everything Jesus offers is greater than what's come before it. And that it is what we need for this life and the life to come. From here on out, the author of Hebrews will, will, will turn to encouraging his audience to keep on with their faith, to press forward. And he'll offer words of encouragement and correction and offer some bits of, of doctrine for daily life going forward from here. We're, we're, we're nearing the end of the book. We only have uh, the rest of chapter 10 and then 11, 12, and 13 to go. So maybe by August, we'll wrap this thing up. But this book is a powerful and, and detailed look at the Christian faith. And I hope that these videos have helped uh, to uh, explore this for you. If you're just down watching our videos, you can go to our website with, with all the... Ugh. <laughs> I don't know why I can't say our website name. You can go to bethaltochurch.com slash Hebrews, and you can find the audio lessons from previous classes there, and we can, you can find videos for the past month, month and a half on YouTube uh, as well. Guys, it's been great talking to you tonight. I hope that you are uh, staying safe and staying home, and we will hopefully see each other in a few weeks. Bye.